All right, if everybody's ready, we'll get started. Um, first of all, let's just pray and do a little prayer and hope for the grace of God to be with us. Holy and loving God, we ask you to be with us tonight as Renee and I uh, present our, our presentations and that you are with us to give us the words we need to speak, the love we need to show, and the, that all the participants will get what they need out of what they hear tonight. Amen. So my name is Anna Felciano. I am a member of the Geyserville Christian Church, and I'm also the recorder for the women's ministries for the CCNCN. Uh, tonight, I'm speaking about the uh, woman to woman trip in 2019 that went to Morocco. So if everybody's ready, we'll get started on a slideshow. It'll be just a second while I share my screen. Oh, sorry, I'm kind of new at this. Okay, thank you for your patience to begin with. And also I wanted to let everyone know that at the end of each presentation, there'll be a time for questions. So as you have questions, go into the Q&A portion of the menu and type it out and Jim will let us know when those questions are ready. So we went um, to the Kingdom of Morocco last year in 2019. Uh, Morocco is in Africa, the northern part of Africa. It kind of borders the Atlantic Ocean and the Mediterranean Sea. Um, one of the largest cities is Casablanca. That was where we flew into, and it was a huge city. Let me tell you, I'm from a small northern California town of Geyserville, which is about, oh, 2,000 people, and there's probably millions in Casablanca. So it was quite the, quite the experience. Uh, what is Women to Women Worldwide? Well, it's part of the Disciples Women, and it was created in 1989 to help women from the United States and Canada learn what life is like as a woman of faith in other countries around the world. So the Disciples Women's Ministry works in collaborations with global ministries for these trips. Here is our group that went. We had uh, representatives from different states. There was 12 of us. Um, we had representatives from Texas, Tennessee, North Dakota, Oregon, uh, North Carolina, two of us from California, one from Northern California and Southern California. So that was kind of nice. Uh, and to start our trip, you know, we didn't, nobody knew any, each other. We only knew each other through email. So we all met in Indianapolis and that's where we left from. And from there we, in, while in Indianapolis, we were uh, prepared for our journey. Uh, we worked together to just become a community and to learn how to uh, become listeners. We needed to get rid of our preconceived notions of what to expect in another in that other country. We need to go with clean slate because we were knew we were going to learn a lot about the people of Morocco. So we flew into Casablanca and from there we were all over the country. We went from there to Rabat, to Tangier, to Fez, to Ujda, back uh, to Meknes, back to Rabat, and then 
to Marrakesh and back to Casablanca for the ride home. We spent a lot of time on a bus, so that really got us together as a community, <laughs> uh, but it was a lot of fun. We had a great time and learned quite a bit. So we were working with the Evangelical Protestant Church of Morocco. Uh, Morocco is primarily uh, an Islam country and it is a kingdom. So the king has allowed the Protestant church to be in Morocco and also the Catholic church. But those are basically the only Christian churches allowed. Uh, the Evangelical Protestant Church of Morocco works with many of the migrants coming from the Sub-Saharan Desert. Uh, they deal helping people from different countries such as uh, Nigeria, the Ivory Coast, Cameroon, the Congo, uh, all those war-torn countries and economically strapped. Um, they have ministries for students. They do have a theological college there also, which is interesting. Uh, we had to, we had the first, we had the opportunity at each church that we went to, we got to listen to the stories of the women and the migrants that came from these countries. And um, sometimes it was very hard on us to listen to the stories. It was, uh, it was, it was a hard thing to do, but it made us better people. This is uh, the biggest mosque in Casablanca and the place is huge and beautiful. The architecture is gorgeous over there. Uh, here we are after one of our um, sessions, we, after each session that we had with the people, we were given a meal and we were able to speak with them to learn more about their countries and the reasons why they came here. And the food of course was delicious, um, but it was always a great community community time. Uh, the, one of the fun things we did is we went to where the Atlantic Ocean and the Mediterranean met. This is Peter Macari. He was our global uh, ministries uh, executive that was with us the whole trip. He spoke Arabic and French. Um, so he was able to translate for us a lot. Uh, the languages in Morocco are primarily Arabic, Berber, and French. This is uh, one of the cute little girls at, at one of the churches that we went to. It was a lot of fun to have a little baby around. You know, lots of grandmas there to take care of her. This is Emanuela and Fritz Joseph. They were our mission coworkers. They planned the whole trip for us, um, was with us the whole time, uh, made sure that we had all the accommodations we needed. I mean, it was a great, they were a great source for us uh, at that trip. Another view of the Mediterranean and the Atlantic. And it was interesting as you're standing at the meridian, I guess you'd call it, you could tell which side was the Mediterranean and which side was the Atlantic. The Atlantic was a more rough ocean where the Mediterranean was more calm. I thought that was interesting. <laughs> the sunset in Tangier, it was really hot. <laughs> in Casablanca, we went to a church that is um, helps a many refugees coming into Morocco. And the reason that they're coming through Morocco is because Morocco is the closest to Spain and they're trying to get from their countries of origin into Europe to become refugees so that they could have a better life. Um, the people that work for the evangelical church and the volunteers help them get food, clothing, housing. Um, they can't work really legally. Uh, it's illegal for a migrant to have a job in Morocco. So they really help out a lot with the families and the women, especially to get what they need to survive. Um, 
this was Johnny. He was in charge of that church in Casablanca's volunteer program with the uh, Church of Morocco. And uh, he was very resourceful. He helped many, many people in that church. We went on to Rabat and Rabat is the capital city, um, but to where the king lives. So you could tell the difference. Uh, Casablanca was a little more dirty, kind of, you could tell it was lived in. It was an old city where Rabat was more clean and, you know, drivers were a little better, <laughs> but um, so you kind of knew that's where the king lived. <laughs> uh, Sheila Spencer, who went with us, she was from Indiana, and she is from the Disciples Women's Ministries Global, I want to say Global Ministries, but I could be wrong. Anyway, she was asked to present a self-care workshop for the pastors that are in uh, Morocco. And Rabat, that's where the college is for, the theological college is in Rabat, so they did a presentation there and uh, the pastors that attended just loved it. And they really wanted, they wish they want their wives and husbands could have come. There was one woman pastor. Um, she's the only one so far that's in, in college and trying to get her pastor's uh, certificate. Although there are other students, but she's the closest to getting it. There's Sheila and Emanuela doing the presentation. And these are the pastors that were present from all over. Um, their countries of origin were all different, of course. Uh, this was the Kasbah that we went to, a big fort on the sea. So it was good that we had, um, they had did a good job of mixing in fun stuff for us to do, sightseeing, that kind of thing, along with the meeting of the folks and hearing the heavy stories that they had to tell. This was at the Cosbo, they called this the Blue City. All the doors and Everything was blue in this place. We went to Tangier, which is right on the coast. And it was a pretty, very modern city. And uh, they were, it's closest to Sueta, where is Sueta and Melilla are Spanish territories in Morocco. So a lot of folks are refugees, migrants, trying to get to Europe, we'll go to Sueta and try to cross the border. We did go and we were supposed to go into Spain, into that city, but we weren't able to because of some paperwork problems with the bus. But we were at the border. This is the border. Out here, it was really foggy that day, but out here is the sea. and one of the border patrol persons. This is the checkpoint where everybody's trying to get in. And at one point, somebody had said that they saw one of the younger kids um, try to attach themselves to the bottom of a car in order to get through, to the, bo through the border checkpoint, but it didn't work and he got caught. Excuse me, another border patrol. <clears throat> this was a young fellow we saw. Um, he looked like he was about 15 and, you know, he was begging for food and wanting to get into Europe. Um, it was really, that was a hard, hard thing to see. Uh, here we're at a church in. Um, I want to say this one was in Tangier. We did our Sunday service there, which was a lot of fun. Uh, there's lots of music 
And the Sunday service goes on for hours because that's how the migrants can make a community is by going to church. So at church, that's where they meet the people that they know. They can enjoy themselves and not worry about what's happening around them at that time. We had gone out to dinner with the group from Tangier and they were a lot of fun. Um, the Sheila was our guest speaker at the church in Tangier and, and Emanuela translated for her. So it was uh, really great for them, for the people of the church to hear a different kind of sermon. Um, they took a big group photo of us and presented it to Pat Donahue, who is our uh, leader. And uh, that was a lot of fun. There's Emanuela trans translating for Sheila. And you can see it's uh, lots of musical instruments. They had a great time. And even though we didn't speak the language, you could feel the music and really understand how welcome we were there. It was, it was really good. That's the pastor of that church. And him and Peter. And then it was on to Fez. Um, Fez is kind of in the middle of Morocco, and it was a a little church that helped bring people together. Um, we visited the church there, and we spoke with these folks. These are people from all different countries: Nigeria, the Congo. Like I said, the Ivory Coast, Cameroon. And this is where we heard, um, I heard, they split us up into groups and we heard each of us heard different stories. And so one of the folks, the group that I was in, uh, oh, let me go back. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> the group that I was in, the woman was from, uh, Cameroon and she and a group of seven women had migrated into Morocco. They were at the border sleeping in the forest and the police came. Four of the women, other women ran. She was caught, raped, her paperwork stolen. And because of that rape, she became pregnant. And she, because Morocco does not recognize um, children that are born of Morocco, you know, in a rape situation or any situation really, if you're born to an immigrant, you're not recognized. So, and there was no way that she could find out who it was because they would not have prosecuted anyway. So the child is, well, at the time, he's probably three now, he was maybe two. And she, you know, was told her feelings were that, you know, she was angry that she was raped and she became pregnant. But at the same time, she loved this child. Her family in Cameroon said, just come back, we'll help you just come back. But she couldn't travel with the child. If she left Morocco, she would literally have to leave the child on the street. And she said, I just can't do that. I can't leave my child on the street to fend for himself at two years old. So right now she's kind of in limbo because she doesn't have paperwork. She can't get paperwork, birth certificate or anything for the child. So she's kind of in a place where she's stuck. So that's where the church is helping her get somewhere to live, food, clothing, that kind of thing. Here's our group, um, still in Tangier. <clears throat> or no, in Fez, I'm sorry. Uh, we uh, got to see quite a bit and talk to the people. It was a good, that was a good trip. <clears throat> uh, 
Also, the different churches in the different cities kind of had different specialties. The church in Ujda was more medical, so they would go there for medical needs. And here's the, some of the women that we spoke with um, and learned their stories. So what we're reminded of is, um, you know, we were actually sitting at the feet of these people learning about them. So it took us, we had to learn to, or we had to be graceful in our responses and we can't, you know, we were told up front, you can't fix anything. All you can do is listen. And so that's what we did. This is the, um, that's still in Fez. And in Ujda, uh, we, that church is big and it sits between a mosque and the palace, one of the king's palaces. So it's an interesting layout as far as where the church is located. And they share that church with the Catholic church. Um, and at, in Ujda, they have, this was the person in charge in Ujda, and they have rooms that the migrants can stay in for a certain amount of time and they have food and they also have programs where they learn a trade. This was inside the church, beautiful architecture. And then they had these big murals on the wall and they were pretty powerful, the different murals, as you can see, you know, it really spoke about why they left the countries they left. Um, they were given classes to do different things. Um, one of the one of the young men that was there was blind. And so he had people helping him, which was nice. Um, the pretty tree. <laughs> One, that's Fritz and the church in Ujda is where Fritz is the pastor. The kids love Jasmine. <laughs> they were really drawn to her. Here's the kitchen where they learned uh, there. Some of the students were learning to cook different things. There was a bakery, a uh, baker's class. There was pastries and things and a library. They had a, that was a big, big place. And then um, the students that were ba learning to bake, baked us cakes for the lunch. And I don't know, there's a kind of a good picture. They <laughs> decorated this cake for us. Always lots of food and lots of hospitality. And of course, when we got to Meknes, we did have to go to McDonald's. And McDonald's is the only fast food restaurant that is present in Morocco. Um, they have the, um, it just left my brain what it's called. Halal, halal. They're approved for halal. So, their food was actually pretty good. <laughs> it was good. And we were off to Rabat again. And Rabat, um, we spoke with other people, heard, heard stories. Um, you know, the, there in Rabat, they concentrate on women that are pregnant and help them have the babies and pay for the hospital and and that kind of thing. Um, so I don't know what happened to my slideshow, sorry. <clears throat> so Morocco, um, 
a lot of migrants come from all over. Algeria is most, they come through Algeria to Morocco and then try to get to Spain. Part of what the Evangelical Church of Morocco is also trying to do is to kind of convince the migrants that it's not so great in Europe, just kind of like, you know, migrating to America is good, but it may not be the best way because we're not golden streets with money flowing everywhere. <laughs> milk and honey, the land of milk and honey, right? <clears throat> and the CEI, um, so there is a, that's what the, I couldn't tell you what it means in French, but it, or even pronounce it, but it's basically the uh, evangelical church volunteers that take care of the migrants. And then we're off to Marrakesh. Marrakesh is a very uh, modern city also. And it was interesting as we went from older cities to more modern cities, you could tell where, how, how the flow of people go because in the older cities, when you, in the afternoon, when you drove by the cafes, you only saw men in the cafes drinking coffee or tea and smoking cigarettes. But in Marrakesh and some in Ujda, the younger women were out and about more, more so in the afternoons. So you could tell it's kind of a more modern vibe. We met Patricia, who is part of the um, National Women's Ministries for the Evangelical Church of Morocco. So her, she's like the equivalent of Pat Donahue in our in America, and she owns a salon and she does seamstress work. She trains a lot of the migrants on how to do different things like hair, sewing, that kind of thing to help them to learn to uh, find ways of making an income you know, they're offering food and that kind of thing to everybody. So it's, um, she does a lot of work throughout Morocco but with that. Now the Catholic church that's also allowed in Morocco does not have a women's ministry. So a lot of the younger women and adult, young adults are coming to the, to the Christian church. There's uh, Pamela, and Pat. And then we go back to Casablanca. And when we're back at Casablanca, um, we, it was mostly just kind of downtime. It was time for us to, you know, we got in late and we had to get up early to catch our flight the next day. But we had a, a debriefing and um, it was very, encouraging that we could learn so much about the migration patterns of Africa. And, and it really kind of parallels the uh, United States in a way. Um, one of the things that I learned was that, you know, I am, it really brought forward the fact that I am privileged. I am a privileged white woman. And I think, you know, I, I don't know that much that I can do about it, but I recognize it and I see it and I try to not act like a first world person, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, the migrants that we spoke to with, you know, mostly they just wanted to tell their stories. They wanted us to be able to come back home, tell their stories, so that they don't just disappear, you know, because a lot of times they felt as if nobody saw them. But here we were, a group of American women ready to hear them. So that was what was the biggest uh, lesson for me anyway, is to know that, wow, I can at least tell their story and it doesn't go away. So the ministries, Global Ministries partner, Evangelical Protestant Church of Morocco um, is what we 
decided to give as the women's ministries woman to woman group. Um, so if you'd like to donate, you can. Uh, you can mail your donations or you can also go online to globalministries.org and um, give a donation towards that. They can use all the help they can get. Um, we haven't heard anything about what's happening over there in Morocco with COVID or any of that. You know, things drastically changed from 2019 to 2020, as we all know. So um, I am just privileged, I am honored that I was able to do this trip and to learn so much about the world. Um, you know, like I said in the beginning, I came come from a small town and this just is just a great way to experience life outside of your little circle. So I would encourage anyone to try if they can to participate. I know the 2020 trip was canceled, but I'm sure they're gearing up for 2021. And here we are again in front of that mosque, that huge mosque. So thank you. Um, I am honored that you were able to listen to what I had to say. And if you have any questions, you can put them in the Q&A section and Jim will give them to me and I'll answer as best I can. Thank you for listening. Okay, uh, we have one question here. What did you say what nations the migrants flee from uh, and the reasons for migration is war, is it war or persecution? Um, so they migrate from the Sub-Saharan Desert. So it was the Ivory Coast, the Congo, Cameroon, um, Nigeria, um, little tiny country that starts with a B. <laughs> I can't think of what it's called, I'm sorry. Uh, but it was, yeah, it was because of war, persecution, economic downfall of the country. Um, some of the women said that they were business people in their country and lost everything because of the economy and decided to leave. So uh, that was the reasons. So thank you very much. And I'm gonna hand it over to Renee. Thank you ladies for being here, first of all. I am just so privileged to uh, present this to you. And I did this in the form of a sermon. And I've done this at um, First Christian Church Vallejo for one of my internship um, assignments. And I really liked the way it flowed. So I decided that this is what I was gonna do for this presentation. So I hope you're okay with that. It's a little bit different from what we typically see, but um, we are a church and we do worship God. And I think God needs to be brought into it. So I hope you enjoy this. So I'm gonna give you a scripture that I use for this sermon and I'm gonna read that right now. So it is Mark 12, 28 through 34. It's from the message version. The most important commandment. One of the religious scholars came up, hearing the lively exchanges of questions and answers, seeing how sharp Jesus was in his answers, he put in his question, which is the most important of all commandments? Jesus said, the first in importance is, listen, Israel, the Lord your God is one. So love the Lord your God with all your passion and prayer and intelligence and energy. And here is the second, love others as you have loved yourself. There is no other commandment that ranks with these. The religion scholar said, what a wonderful answer teacher. So lucid and accurate that God is one and there is no other. 
and loving him with all the passion and intelligence and energy and loving others as well as you love yourself. Why, that's better than all the offerings and sacrifices put together. When Jesus realized how insightful he was, he said, you're almost there, right on the border of God's kingdom. After that, no one asked a question. Here are the words of God for the people of God. So this scripture is in the very essence of Jesus's teachings, right? The incident in Mark occurs in the portion of the gospel where we find Jesus in the opposition to the religious leaders of Israel. Leaders were in the process of rejecting the person and ministry of Christ. And we're seeking to find fault with him in order to discount his ministry and teaching among common people. So a lot like what was happening in Rwanda. And as I go on through this sermon, I'm going to change pictures so you get to see all the things we did in Rwanda. So in 1994, the governmental powers right before the genocide happened were plotting the Hutus and the Tutsis against each other. As Mark shows, this scribe was there on behalf of the Pharisees to test the Lord. Because of their jealousy and animosity against the Savior, they were looking for evidence to discredit the ministry and teachings of Jesus. Obviously, such an obsession revealed a shallow, unproductive externalism. This caused them to miss their own sinfulness and God's absolute holiness. But that's not all, right? This preoccupation caused them to miss the very heart, goal, and central theme of the Bible. Simply put, their legalism caused them to miss the very purpose of the word and their purpose as the people of God, right? Just like the leaders of Rwanda. So this scribe comes closest to the honest question concerning what is first and foremost in the law. Which commandment is first of all? Jesus answers the question not only with the first commandment, but the second. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The scribe acknowledges Jesus' response as true and highly praised by Jesus with words, you are not far from the kingdom of God. The engagement in the temple is over and Mark reports after that, no one dared to ask him any questions. The people, however, have been blown away by the Lord's insightful answers and the masterful way he handled the scripture. But what exactly... What exact significant meaning of this question? See, understanding our purpose and having goals in harmony with the teachings of this wonderful passage is equivalent to vision. In other words, the, passion, the, the passage here is visionary. It gives us perspective of life, which is the very heart and goal of this scripture. It's like the light that guides us in our passage through the dark, and treacherous waters of life. This is how the people of Rwanda became that light. Having nearly 2 million people brutally murdered, even hunted down and killed, after the Hutus were convinced that the Tutsis were going to take over and drive them into extinction. So they must do it first. This government was extremely sick and they had them believing this. For some reason, so this is pictures of the genocide museum that we got to see. It was horrific. The Hutus that did not want to do any of this were either made to do it or killed themselves by their very own tribe, family, or neighbors. They were literally made to do this. There was no choice. 
This is the memorial grounds of where they're all buried from this area. What I also learned was that they used dogs to hunt down and kill the people. They used them to find anyone who hid and they also let them eat the dead people. While I was there, I only seen a total of four dogs. Well, five, counting the one working at the airport doing the screenings. This dog was awesome. But I was told it was because of the genocide that people are deathly afraid of dogs. And they have memories that they still struggle with today. People literally seen their family members being attacked by dogs and eaten. It was really a sick thing that happened. But as a crazy dog lady, I still understood that. These are the dogs. You know I'm crazy dog lady, I can't help myself. So this one was guarding us at nighttime at, our, at the first place we went to in Kigali. And this was the dog's bed during the day. The man was convinced that the dog would bite us who had this dog. So he kept him in this horrible place all day and let this dog come out at night. Well, I snuck out and met this dog. It was literally the nicest dog I have ever met in my entire life. I think I actually like hurt myself by meeting this dog. I like cried for so long. This poor dog is in this house. And um, sadly, these folks really believe that dogs are that violent and it's really sad. So back to the scripture, because I'll get lost on dog views. In light of Jesus' answer and his purpose here in the scripture, the question was written to point us to the ultimate goal of the Bible and the impact of God, right? God wants us to have on our lives the hope in those we care for and the love. The answer given here by the Lord becomes both a compass and a barometer in our study of the word and ministry and building each other up in the Lord. It directs us and helps us gauge our own situation and that of others we are walking and progressing with together in our walk with God. The command to love God illustrates the truth that God's special revelation demands an appropriate response one in keeping with the character and essence of God. This is what it reveals to me. There must be a personal emphasis. Literally, verse 30 says, you shall love the Lord your God. This brings out the necessity of a personal element. So my belief is only through personal faith, through Jesus Christ, does God become one's own personal God. Now, the nature of love is a verb. It's called a gapeo. This is a verb of intelligence and purpose, sacrifice, and hard decisions. A gapeo is a willful love, a determined love that generously chooses for the interests of others. A gapeo and a gape, the noun form, speak of love that grows out of knowledge. It comes from knowing the true God and all God's greatness and grace. You can't work up agape of love by emotional passion. So people think that by this, they love God, which is not so. The source of this love, the words with all your, is literally from the source of this is the point which action or emotions proceed. Love for God flows out of the inner life that is filled and mo motivated by a faith relationship with God. Through the knowledge of Jesus and the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the extent of this love 
the words with all are repeated with each noun to place equal emphasis on the task that we are to use in loving God. Also, the word all is the Greek holos, from which we get the word holistic. It means whole, entire, complete. This strongly stresses the fact that there can be no holding back our deficiency in our devotion and commitment to God. This, my friends, is exactly what the people of Rwanda showed me. When I went to the first church to preach on New Year's Day, right here on this day, with, for this church, I was literally, I had no idea where I was going. They drove me to this back road, like probably about 45 minutes to an hour in this village really impoverished, really remote. I had no idea who these people were. And they just dropped me off and said, you're safe. Don't worry about it. <laughs> That's where faith kicks in. So they asked us to preach if we would be willing to preach. And of course, I'm not going to go all the way to Rwanda and not say yes. Like who does that, right? I mean, what an opportunity to like preach in another country. So the pastor was super nice to me. He welcomed me with open arms, thanked me for being there, gave me a robe to wear. And I sat in the pulpit overwhelmed with emotion that I, me, me, was all the way in Rwanda on a seminary trip. Y'all, no, just being in seminary blows me away. About to preach to these beautiful people who were honestly happy to see me. Like the people in Rwanda were like the happiest, nicest people ever. Always happy. At that time, I felt so unworthy. Like, who was I to come into their church and preach to them? And they had so much to teach me. Look at those little kids are so cute. It was such a mixed bag of feelings. What I didn't fully take in is that I was preaching for a very conservative Anglican church. And that pastor, who also was my interpreter for the day, was actually the archdeacon of the Kigali Diocese. Like, this is the second top dude in charge. He's like a bigwig. It was an amazing day, and because it was New Year's Day, they had tons of celebrations, and the kids graduated to different places in their schooling and in their church, and oh, they had, I think, five or six choirs, and they had me dancing. It was the thing to do. It was so fun. Yes. So I got to preach in that church. I'm trying to get my thing... There it is. So here, this is the archdeacon. He was so kind. And as soon as we got done, he's like, you have to come to my house for a Fanta. <laughs> a Fanta? Really? So I got to his house and actually his daughters made me a whole spread of food. And we actually had plans to go somewhere else for a meal. So I had to tell him that like my stomach was a little twisted from, from, you know, preaching, but I get really nervous. So I had a small meal with him and still had room for a meal with other people. So what I later learned at the cow giving ceremony from a young lady who had escorted me to the bathroom, we got to use the pastor's bathroom instead of the outdoor, um, they just had like shacks. Uh, you'll see a teacher's bathroom which is really like upscale compared to these like it was just wood a wood shack in a hole in the ground and it was just like cemented and you just try and hit the hole the best you can so that was their bathrooms but this pastor let us use his indoor bathroom 
So I asked why not one person in Rwanda, not one had tattoos, not one. Like I lived all over the streets, everything. And none of them had tattoos. And so the girl proceeded to tell me that if you have tattoos in Rwanda, you are not even considered a Christian at all. So here I was tattooed, pierced, crazy hair colors, yet this pastor and another pastor later was allowing me to preach in their pulpits. It was pretty wild. I got to admit, though, I, I am pretty rebellious, and it was fun to break those barriers. And I love to see those broken here in the States more often because they just greeted me with open arms and allowed it. And it was super fun. So at the cow gifting, they got to give nine cows. We raised money to give cows to the villages. And what they do is um, they give these cows out of to the person who needs it the most in the village. Like they actually get into groups in the village and figure out who is the most needy in their village. Like who does that here in the States, right? They also like will get together in groups and put all their money together and help the most needy in their town or village we don't do that here and i wish we, we we have so much to learn from the rwandans um but anyhow they find who's the most needy and they work with the church and the government believe it or not this is a government-run program to help their people um so they do this and the person who is the most needy but also has the way to feed the cow. They're gifted the cow, which is awesome. And then the firstborn cow from that, because they'll they will pay to have it impregnated, because they buy all girl cows, and they pay to have them impregnated. And the firstborn, that person has to gift it to somebody else in their village who's just as needy, or if not needier but has ability to take care of them. It's phenomenal what these people do for each other. So what I learned as a person from another country is the Rwandans are living fully as one, right? Like God is one and they are living as one unit, even though they're separate people. There has been reconciliation and forgiveness. The tribes are no longer tribes. They don't recognize tribes at all. There's no Hutus and there's no Tutsis. They're just Rwandans. They do not recognize tribes anymore. They don't talk about them. You can't even ask those questions. It's not going to happen. And if somebody wants to tell you their story, they never mention if they're a Tutsi or Hutu. But you know from their story which one they were. They just don't say it. So when being with the pastors during the training in our work group that our mission provided, because that's why we really went there, um, we went to do some trainings for them. And what happened was um, our um, leader, who was the dean of our school, would give an initial training to guide them on what they needed to work on in their breakout groups. And we ran the breakout groups as the students um, of the seminary. So it was wonderful. So with being with these pastors during the trainings and our work groups, they not only showed their love for God, but they showed their love for one another. They were hugging and laughing and dancing and holding hands and getting excited. And one would share an accomplishment and Everybody would cheer. And what also came to light was all the judgment and preconceived notions that I personally have learned through the years. Like some are so ingrained fully in me. Like you could see two men walking down, just gleefully holding hands. And, you know, in America, we are so judgmental that we would think that this is two men in love. And it's not, you know, 
the agape love, we would assume they're in a relationship. Not these people, not the Rwandans. They just love each other. Just absolutely love each other. And it's not, they can hug and hold hands and men, women, men, men, women, women. It doesn't matter. It's just how it is for them. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Aren't these kiddos cute? I love the kids. I was supposed to be giving milk during the cow cer ceremony, but I was playing with the kids. I didn't get in trouble though. So this is our Dean and she's given the initial training and direction for us. And this is everybody in a group photo. And there I am. This is one of my breakout groups. So we did some peer group work and they're fantastic. They were so excited. These are folks that never even went through school. They just went up in the church and they became pastors and they're open to women pastors, which is really cool. So they're trying to get women to come up into pastorhood, which is fantastic. So there is, when you walk around, there are metal detectors everywhere. Even when you go into the mall, you have to go through a metal detector. The airports have armed police. There are armed police all over the place. Rwanda has zero tolerance for violence. But the government has also pushed for reconciliation. So what they do is like, if somebody has lost their home and or they lost it during during the genocide time, they would take somebody who was convicted during the genocide and somebody who they killed their family and have them work together and build a house together. I mean, and they reconcile during this. They find forgiveness for each other and they become one community. And I'm sure there's underlying things that are going on that they just do not talk about. So there's also a whole initiative to do some real moral injury healing because this is severe moral injury that these people have gone through. So it's wild that they do this. I mean, just to think this only happened 26 years ago. Like just 26 years ago, it actually happened one month before I got sober which is crazy to think about. It just feels like yesterday. There were some who like really wanted to share their stories with us. And it was just so intense when they told us. And that's when I learned really about how the dogs were affected. Um, and I made so many friends. It's incredible. And I still talk to the folks now. I'm going to take you through some of the pictures because we're getting short on time and I could talk forever about Rwanda and I'd be happy to talk to you at any time um, after this or answer questions. But um, we had a day where we had some free time. So we wanted to go horseback riding and they only had two horses and there was like eight of us. So we decided to go for a hike and we got to see the Nile River which was super cool. And then we got to get up close and personal with some monkeys. There were some motorcycle riders on the side of the road feeding them, which I guess it's illegal to do there. But since they were feeding them, we got to get like up close and personal. This middle guy was so close to me, like I could have reached down and touched him, but they also will bite. So the kids who are impoverished, what they do is they collect bottle caps and that's how they play their games with bottle caps instead of like, you know, the old, um, I don't know, the old things we used to play. And they get their water. This is how they carry their water and they'll go for at least two hours. They'll make two hour trips to get water and two hours back home sometimes. And they get it out of these pumps. And usually there's a guy that owns the pump and they charge these people who have no money to start with, terrible. And of course, since I'm a hairdresser, I had to get a Rwanda salon, but you see it says saloon. <laughs> 
and Sunday preaching. This was my second place I got to preach at. It was wonderful. And I still get to talk to these folks. They're so amazing. And I didn't know one of the old archbishops was there listening to me. I'm glad I didn't know this stuff before I started. I'm going to just run through these kind of fast because um, we're out of time and I want to answer your questions. So we had a dinner where they did some leadership acknowledgements and we got to see um, tribal dancing and um, experience all of this. And we found Coca-Cola. Look at this. We stopped on the side of the road and down, down that hill is where all these kids live. Just on the side of the hill. Aren't they cute? This little girl right here said, okay, you give me money now. <laughs> she was so adorable. Just totally adorable. But they knew, you know, like they're so poor and they just, that's the language that they knew. God bless them. See the house down the hill right there? That's where they live. So our last training was in a Northern Providence um, right up by Uganda border. And um, I actually got to go work at a school instead of doing the training instead. And it was fabulous. We did all kinds of training and they even have a garden in their property. The kids are just uber willing to learn. I just love the kids. I think I should just go hang out with kids all the time. So here's the toilet I was talking about. There's a squat toilet. This was a really fancy one. And it was very clean, very, very, very clean. And uh, we actually just kept toilet paper in our pockets. So we had toilet paper because nobody did. And this guy broke barriers. It was so funny because the girls played hand techniques and the boys went and played soccer in the field. And he, I asked him why. And he's like, because boys don't do that. And then a friend that we went with, Miss Margo, made him do it. It was great. It was great. I, I told you I'm rebellious. So Gahini, I'm sorry, that wasn't, the Northern wasn't the last. Gahini was the last. Gahini is, um, was our last stop. Oops, I went the wrong way. I'm trying to go really fast, you guys. I'm very sorry. Um, this was my group of guys. They were fabulous. And they all they wanted to know is like, do my tattoos wash off? They were so cute. They were so excited that I was teaching them. They were so fun. They all wanted to take pictures. That's all they wanted to do. They're like, we know enough. Can we take pictures now? So this is the village. And these are the cute little kids in the village and the women. She was chopping wood like a hardcore bad butt. Yeah. And uh, our last one was at the National Park where we got to go see all the fun, fun animals. Of course. They were just astounding and beautiful and amazing. There were so many zebras all over the place. And look at that ant. That ant was huge. It was just huge. But here is Kigali. That is where we started. I don't know if I can make that any bigger. I'm sorry, I can't. That's where we started in Kigali. And then we went up to the Northern Providence over here. We went to, back to Kigali. And then we went over here to Gahini. And this is where the park was on the edge of Tanzania and Kenya. So that is it. I could keep going forever, but uh, <laughs> y'all can tell me if you have any questions or is there something you wanna know? I don't see any questions coming in. Shall we bring them all into the main room? Yeah, let's bring them in. Everybody ready? Come in. You got your, your, turn your videos on. Go in gallery.
Do you guys have video? You can unmute yourself as well. I don't have video. No. Hi, Miss Emma. Hi, Mary. Hi. 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 Hi, Becky. So good to see you here. And Teresa, my BFF forever, Frenchine. Mm -hmm. So I thank you for your patience. Thank you for sharing. Oh, both was, of you. You're oh. welcome. It was a phenomenal trip and so much to, I could go on and on and on. But uh, how did it compare to, the, to your woman to woman trip? You know, I, I, I left a piece of myself in India. I got it. Um, my woman to woman trip was more um, relational. We got to build more relationships with the people. Um, and that was the whole point of doing the woman to woman was to learn how they do their faith and to learn how to walk alongside of them. And how can we be of service? We weren't like, like Anna said, we weren't there to fix them or do anything else. But the um, Rwanda trip, we were mainly there to give um, the teachings and the things that we got to do on the side was a bonus, you know, but we were there to instruct their, their, um, their um, pastors and their bishops and their archbishops because the Rwandan government is now requiring them to have so much education. So from now on, they actually have to go through a master's and go through seminary and get all that training, but before they did not. So for the ones who went before, they're now requiring a certain amount of training within a certain amount of years. So we were there to supply that training. Does that make sense? Uh -huh. That's why they were so excited because <laughs> some of them have never gotten any type of training like that before ever. Yeah. What was your group was was both men and women that that went? Oh yes, yes. There was um the dean of my school. We had um three of us were students, um, but the one student is actually from Rwanda and he is um an archbishop or an archdeacon um in Gahini so he arranged all the trip with the people in Rwanda and had everything done for us to do um we also had a professor and then um friends of him who were they worked for um um I can't remember what it is it's like um they're not biologists but they work for the environment the environmental protection agency I think um, so they went there to like teach about environment and how they can conserve water and how they can like tap into water sources or make water sources and better supply their, their ability to have gardens and running water and to get rid of disease. So they gave some really great teaching, especially on Genesis, you know, because God made the gardens, right? And God gave us the land and gave us the animals and you know, we need to protect that. So it was powerful. Any other questions? Thank you everyone for taking time out of your day to join us. Yes. Yes. Emma, it's good to see you. Thank you. Yeah. I know you've tried to get some to so, some events, but this has got to be easier for you. Yeah. 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 Good. I'm glad you're here. Okay. Okay. 
And I, I, I especially want to thank Jim for setting this all up and giving us training and taking time and the amazing patience he has is just, it's a godsend. That's a gift all in itself. <laughs> yes, it is. Thank you Jim, very much. Marilyn or Emma, would either one of you like to pray us out for tonight? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I can. All right. Fabulous. Thank you for the light. Thank you for the pain. Thank you for the Two women who are as together that that everyone is blessed with every other the disease Amen. 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 Thank you, Emma. That was awesome. Okay. All right. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a blessed night. Thank you.